As you're learning SQL, have you ever had any issues or confusion with understanding how exactly the SQL query that you're writing is executed behind the scenes? In today's video, we're going to remove all of that confusion and walk away with a good understanding of SQL order of operations. Hello everyone, my name is Zane Goodman with Pragmatic Works, and in today's video, we're going to be uncovering some truths here about order of operations when we're working with SQL. Now, I'm going to be working with T-SQL, but this is going to apply to many, if not all, of the SQL flavors that are out there. You've been writing that query, and let's say you aliased a column name. Then you went to reference that aliased column name in, let's say, the WHERE clause, and you've gotten an error. It says it doesn't really know what that column name is. Well, that issue and many other issues that you might experience like it are oftentimes caused by a misunderstanding of the order of operations. That is, as you write your SQL query and the steps that you take to write that query is not actually how the query is executed behind the scenes within the database. So we're going to go over some examples and demo out the order of operations and we'll bounce back and forth between a slide that you can use as a little bit of a backup so that you can always reference how exactly the queries you are writing are being executed because it will change your fundamental understanding of how to write queries. I'm currently in SQL Server Management Studio and I've got some demos here for us to go through. We're going to just start with a basic query. I have a sales order header table here. And that is going to be my fact table. As I get new orders in, they are going to be placed inside of this table. I am returning sales order ID, order date, ship date, sales order number, customer ID, and total due here. I am then filtering my results in my where clause. I'm saying, hey, you know what? Out of all of the results that are available to me, I'm going to filter all of these rows to where I only see rows where my total due is greater than 500. Then I'm ordering by total due and descending order. All right, so this is not too bad of a query here. If I execute this, we're going to see a result that we very well might expect. Exactly the columns that I looked for, we have 18,547 rows. So let's go over how exactly this has been executed behind the scenes. Here I have a little bit of a diagram that we can walk through to understand that query we just looked at. Whenever you write a query, you got to understand that even though we are first writing out the columns that we want from a table, in order for the database to know and understand where those columns are, we have to give it that information. So whenever you highlight that query and you press the execute button, the first thing that will be run behind the scenes will be the from statement. We got to figure out what are our tables. Then, once we know what our tables are, we might be able to grab those columns. But actually, what's going to happen first is we're going to prepare our data set before we go in and select our columns. So you can think of this as, first of all, we're going to provide in our from statement this wide table. Then the next item on the list is the where clause. The where clause is going to take that larger table and it's going to filter it down. It's going to filter the rows, right? So we're going to have a smaller table at that point. Once the data has been filtered, then we can come in with our select statement and we can pull from that shortened table our columns. Now we've filtered our rows with the where clause. Now with the select statement, we're going to grab only the columns we want. And after that is done, our order by statement will come into play after we have finished up with preparing the data as we see fit. So again, that's the from statement, grab our data. Then we're going to filter our rows. Then we'll select our columns. And finally, once that is all taken care of, we actually know what we're going to be ordering. And that's going to be the order by statement. I'm back over in SSMS here, and we're going to take a look at our next example. And this is where we start to bring in our group by. Let's say I have a situation like this where I know what I have in my sales order header table, but now I'm going to join that to my customers table so I can find out more information about my customers and the sales that they have been a part of, what it is that they've purchased. And in fact, what I want to do is I want to get the sum of the total due for each one of my customers' purchases. That way, if a customer purchases 10 different items that it's inside of my sales order header table, I will be able to group by that customer and sum up how much money have they spent with the organization all time. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. 
in my select statement, I'm connecting to the customer ID. I'm using the sum function and I'm renaming this as total due. Then I'm grabbing my sales order header table as well as my customer table making sure to alias them both, and they're gonna be joined on the customer ID. Now, interestingly enough, I still have my where statement here, and I'm saying where total due is greater than 500. And just to be a little bit more clear here, I think it would be even better if I pasted in here, called this the sum of total due. That way we know what total due that we're talking about. So in my where clause, I have my total due. I'm checking for it to be greater than 500. Then finally, I'm grouping my data. Now, the order in which all of this happens is gonna be very different than the way that we are writing this. So let's go ahead and run this SQL query and see what we get. We're gonna get what I initially expect, which is customer ID and sum of total due. I have 9,737 rows returned to me. But here's another issue with the order of operations. If you don't know or are not aware of them, then you can run into issues you don't even know that are there, unknown unknowns, right? Because there is a big problem with this query. Just as a high level overview, what we're currently doing is we are filtering our table before we have performed any kind of aggregations. And what we're trying to do is figure out where our total due is greater than 500. What I actually want to do is filter on the sum of total due that's greater than 500. So initially you might think, okay, well, I'm gonna copy out this function here, sum of total due, and I'm going to paste it here so I can compare it to 500. If you do that, you are going to get an error. And it says that an aggregate function may not appear in the where clause. So what is the solution here then? What is the hidden problem behind the scenes? Well, that is going to be withheld in the having clause. The having clause is very powerful and it is used for filtering. So it's just like the where clause, but it's for something very specific, which is going to be filtering aggregations. So the moral of the story is, if we need to filter on some aggregation that we perform, like getting the sum of total due for each one of our customers, we have to do that within the having clause. So before we look at the order of operations, let's take a look at that example. So I'm gonna scroll on down just a little bit and you can see that my query is almost exactly the same, but I have a little bit of a change made to it, which is instead of using a where clause, I have my filter in the having clause. What this allows me to do, like we've said, is filter on the sum of total due. Now, I'm still not going to be able to use my alias name, and I'll also change this to sum of total due as well, but I'm also not gonna be able to use the alias name in the having clause, which is pretty interesting. Why might that be the case? Well, if I highlight this query and execute it, you'll see I have a slightly different amount of rows. I have 9,782, and you can compare that to when we use the where clause, I have 9,737. Well, the reason there's a difference is instead of filtering on the data before the aggregation was completed, we are now waiting for the aggregation to be taken care of, and then we will filter the data afterwards. To explain this further, let's look at our order of operation once more. So we've added a few pieces to this diagram here. Again, we're starting with our from statement. And by the way, we have been joining tables here in these examples. When you join tables together, that is a part of your from statement. That is your step where you are defining what is your table looking like before you're going to do anything to it to get that result back to you after execution. Then we're still going to use our where statement afterwards. This is really important. This is why we were not able to filter on the sum of total due in the where clause. It happens right after the from statement. So in your mind, what I want you to think of when you think of the where clause is the where clause is for filtering the initial data set or table before aggregations. Then interestingly enough, in lieu of this goal of preparing our data, we are then going to group that table or group of tables. We're going to group that together. In this case, we're grouping by our customer, of course. So we'll take all of that data where we have one customer who has 10 different records for different purchases. We're going to group that customer. Those 10 rows will be collapsed into one single row, telling us what we'll see here in a moment the result of whatever aggregations we're using. In this case, it'll be the sum of total due. 
Then after our data is grouped, after it is filtered, now we jump over to the having clause. The having clause is where we are going to filter on our aggregations. Finally, after that, then we get to selecting exactly which columns we want. Now, something interesting here that can cause confusion. You might think to yourself, well, Zane, how is it that we are going to use the having clause to filter aggregations if the select statement is where we specify those aggregations? It's a really good question. And it, like I said, it can be a little bit confusing. But to remove the confusion here, that is why we had to repeat that function, that sum function in the having clause. When we look at our select statement, what we're doing is defining what is going to be returned to us, what we want to see in the result. In the having clause, we are going to give it the aggregation a second time, or really in lieu of the order of operations for the first time, telling the database how to filter the data based on that aggregation. Then we get to the select statement and we can specify, okay, well, the columns, what we want to see is customer ID. And then of course, whatever calculated column that we have there, in this case, sum of total due. After the select statement, then we get to a few other pieces, some of which you might use, some of which you might not. Next up is distinct, and I'm gonna go over an example of distinct here in a moment, but that's where you say, hey, I have a lot of repeating customer IDs here in this table, because one person will purchase an item multiple times, but I'm gonna limit that. I only want to see distinct or unique customer IDs. Then you get to the order by. Again, with the order by, we have to make sure that the data is prepared, we've done our filtering, everything's ready to go, before we can then finally say, we are gonna order it by total sales in descending order or something of that nature. And then finally, we get to top and offset, which both of these are helpful to, again, limit the amount of rows returned to you. Maybe you want the top five rows returned to you. Maybe you wanna take that result and offset it to every other row. Whatever that looks like for you, this is how you will be writing it. Whichever of these clauses you'll be using, this is the process it's going to go through regardless of how you're writing out your SQL query. So before moving on, let's take a look one more time at our where statement compared to our having statement. Because I think after looking at the order of operations here, we might be able to better understand what happened. Up at the top, ignoring that we cannot use the sum function in the where clause, if we were to simply filter on total due being greater than 500, what would we be doing? Well, we would be filtering the rows before anything has been aggregated meaning we could be getting incorrect data because by all means, we are looking for the sum of all of the total due for each of our customers. If we limit it beforehand, then any orders that a customer has made that is less than 500, well, that'll never be included in the sum aggregation. Again, we're missing data. We are looking at incorrect data at that point. Compare that to the having clause where we are able to have all of the data there ready to go for us. We haven't limited the rows in any way outside of what we could do with the where clause, which we're not doing it in this query. Then we are able to sum all of the total due up and we're able to filter on it afterwards, getting the correct answer that we are looking for. Mind you though, there's no errors here telling us that information. So that's why it's important to have the order of operations in the back of your mind as you are writing out your SQL queries. Now moving on to top and order by. Number one, we looked at the order of operations there. Both top and order by are going to be clauses that are going to be executed towards the end of the statement. When it comes to top, what is that doing? Well, it is limiting whatever our result is to the amount of rows that we select to bring back. It makes sense that this is going to happen at the end because we have a lot to do in that query before we're gonna say we only want the top five records. If we did it any sooner, then that would probably cause us a lot of issues, issues that we might not be able to see. Just like when we tried to filter in the where clause, when that's not really what we wanted to do. Then when we look at the order by, if I execute this, I am ordering by the sum of total due here. And the point that I want to make is that I am actually using the alias for sum of total due, this aggregation here I, that I have in the select statement. Why am I able to do that? Well, again, I'm able to do that because the order by statement occurs after the select statement. That right there is why if you've been writing your queries and you went to go reference an alias column name in a where statement or somewhere else, and you've gotten a weird error, 
this is why. If I were to reference an alias column name in the where statement, I'm going to get an error because the select statement hasn't been executed yet. The database doesn't know what that name is. That's why we can use it in the order by statement. Back to our examples here. That is our top in order by. I also wanted to show you offset here, where I am selecting almost the same information, but I added a window function here so we could just visualize the offset a little bit better. If I execute this, I'm able to look at the result here and easier tell that my offset is working. And again, this goes back to the order of operations. This is going to be happening at the end of the query execution, because before we do any kind of offsetting here, the rest of our work needs to be completed. Moving on down once more to our last example, we have distinct. Distinct is going to take from my sales order header, my customer ID. If we take a look at it, I have 31,465 rows. I purchased many things from Amazon, right? So on their fact table, I'm going to show up in more than one row. But if I want to look at a distinct list of all of my customers, I can use distinct in this fashion, and I would get 19,119 rows showing me my distinct list of customer IDs. This is going to be happening after my select statement, right along with it almost, because after we performed our filtering, after we performed our aggregations, after we've grouped all of our data, we finally selected our columns. And from that list of selected columns, from that data set that we've been curating in the query, then we're going to select to limit it even further via distinct. With that being said, that is your SQL order of operations. Again, this is going to apply to most, if not all, of the different flavors of SQL out there. I am using T-SQL here in a SQL server. But nonetheless, keep this in the back of your mind here, because as you're writing queries, having a good understanding of this will change how you write them and how you are looking for data. The example that we had between the where statement and the having clause is very, very common or is a very, very common pitfall to fall into because there's no error message to tell us that something went wrong. But having a good understanding of when what is happening, again, is going to empower us to write better queries with correct and accurate data. Now, if you would like to learn more about T-SQL specifically, check out our course, the T-SQL Introduction by my colleague, Manuel Quintana, diving headfirst into an introductory look at T-SQL. We also have classes for the intermediate and the advanced level as well. And I would love to see all of my SQL veterans out there in the comments, giving your tips and tricks to all of the new SQL developers that are out there to give them some help as they continue to learn. I hope that you enjoyed this video and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.